Should we slowly get started? I think we can start. Yeah. Well, first of all, it's great to have some of you here, mostly new faces to me. There's one or two people that I met who are in Berlin, but then I think the rest is coming from yeah many different places. I heard someone from New Zealand, there's some people from Canada, some people from the US. This is a new format that we're trying out after last episode where we spoke about community that yeah, maybe it makes sense also to actually you know, try to live that a little bit and to see what happens if we let some more voices into the room to, to have a conversation and to see what type of feedback you have and what type of thoughts you have on what we've been discussing. Yes, yeah, so a secular Christ came out of a conversation that Sean and I had uh, in the spring last year for Psychology on the Cross, where we had a discussion that we entitled, This is not the end of the road. Or that was something that Sean said in the conversation, you know, psychoanalysis is not the end of the road. I picked up on that and wrote Sean an email a few weeks after and said like, you know, okay, but what's, you know, can we talk about that road and how that looks or how, 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 how you imagine that? And, you know, your experiences around Christianity, religion, and that link from, from psychoanalysis to, to the question of faith and, and doubt with that. Me and Sean actually did, together with another colleague, a podcast back in 2016. I don't know if you remember that, Sean, but we did a little experiment with what we call psychoanalysis on the street back then where we had some conversations and I've been trying to find that online, but it's completely lost somewhere. It's not to be found, which is somehow refreshing today that you cannot always find everything on how it's been deleted. But for today, I, 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 uh, with that, I would like to, to invite you, Sean, to start to discuss a little bit what we've gone through in the last season and to see what thoughts you have put together around that. So we have maybe a, yeah, 25, 30 minutes, uh, lecture from Sean, and then the rest of us can join in, or the rest of you can join in, something like that. Yeah, I don't want to go for 25 or 30 minutes. I, since we're live, I'd like to hear more from others. But I, I could say a few things to start us, to get us thinking. <clears throat> the second season, we started with this concept of Christ nature, and I was explicit that this was a riff off of Mahayana Buddhism, the Mahayana Buddhist concept, Buddha nature, which is this sort of ineffable, undefinable, ubiquitous, infinite presence of the power of enlightenment in the cosmos. And I was arguing that actually Christians have pretty much the same concept, only they call it something different. They call it the cosmic Christ, and it comes out of Paul's letters primarily, but also John's gospel. But the two letters, the two crucial letters here, Paul's letter to the Ephesians and Paul's letter to the Colossians. But the word cosmic Christ, for me, it sounds like I, I hear this word and I see this sort of luminous figure in the heavens. And that's not what we want. We don't want an objectification of the Christ. We already have the objectification of the Christ in the historical Jesus. So the, the notion of the cosmic Christ should really be something much less determinate than, you know, a figure in the heavens. And so we introduce this idea of Christ's nature, which means it doesn't actually have a specific form necessarily, but it assumes whatever form it needs to. It's, it's assuming many forms. And I think we introduced this concept because we thought it was important for understanding how the secular age is also an age of redemption. Or in an old-fashioned language, you could say the secular age is also an age of the church. <clears throat> And my, my, my sense here is that this is, this is authentically Christian non-dualism. You know, the, the, uh, the logic which you mostly associate with Buddhism and to some degree Hinduism, that we can't have this ex these, these exclusive binaries will, will betray the phenomena, you know? And we can't, be, we can't, we can't have a, a, an exclusive language around the Christ or around the experience of truth, but neither do we want everything to just sort of be collapsed into an amorphous oneness. The non-dual concept, as many people know already, because it's become quite a, a meme in the internet religion world, is, is, a, is a unity with distinction within it. It doesn't deny the distinction. And it doesn't even deny the tension. In fact, the tension is crucial. It's the union of opposites in the union language, the coincidentia oppositorum. So the, the, in the Christian context, the non-duality concerns oppositions like sinner and saved. 
coming out of Luther. You know? We are simultaneously sinners and we are simultaneously saved. Simul justus et peccator. Luther says we can't let go of either of those. If we start wandering around feeling that we are confirmed in grace and we can no longer fall, we are just saved. We, we, we all the way home is an unfortunate title of a book from the 80s by Matthew Fox. We'll be distorting the situation because we're only saved by virtue of being sinners. And if we wander around morbidly obsessing on our failures and our limitations and our inability to enact the Christ nature, at least to the sense in the to the degree that we think we should, we'll also be missing the, the boat. Somehow we have to be comfortable with both being a sinner, that is absolutely failing to meet the, 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 the standard which, which has been set for us in the gospel, and saved, that is not needing to do it ourselves because it's done for us. There are other Christian non-dualisms I think we could talk about, and we have talked about, the human and the divine in, united in the Christ, the profane and the sacred. Or indeed, why not the secular and the religious, which is, I think, what the whole inspiration of this discussion was, that the secular and the religious are not two. That is, where secularism rules, we do not necessarily see the end of religion, the abolition of religion, or the, or the exclusion of Christianity. So this Christian non-duality, though, like any non-duality, it should not be cheap. And I'm, I'm very conscious of this cheap non-duality because you see it in, you know, in, in, in discussions online where it becomes a sort of, I'm floating above the tension, I'm floating above the distinctions, and I'm looking at both sides, and I see salvation and sin, I see God and man, I see East and West, I see secular and religious. That's cheap in the sense that the point of non-duality, as far as I understand, it, is, is not to give us the kind of get out of jail free card here you can transcend the human perspective and see things as God sees them. On the contrary, we're always stuck down in the binary and we're always on one side or the other of it. So there's going to be this kind of excruciating dynamic to the spiritual life where you will have these great ups and these great downs. You will feel supercharged with, in, with the light of God one day and you'll feel like a miserable bum the next day. And, the, and the, the non-dual Christian attitude would be to actually stay with the tension between these and not wish it otherwise. The grace is not ours, and the sin doesn't matter. And I think that's, when we, when we hear that being expressed, we are hearing Christ's nature. We are experiencing Christ's nature. Christ's nature is, being, is coming to the surface, or it's coming to consciousness. It's being acknowledged as such. We also talked a fair bit about Shin Buddhism because it's been a real inspiration for me in terms of understanding Paul in this way. And we didn't get into it in any scholarly way, but in the Shin tradition, there was this concept of other power. And there's a, there's a keen sense of how the Buddhist practitioner can become deceived. Even, even with his best intentions or best intentions, they can become deceived and become relying, reliant on self-power. You know, I... I'll do the seven-day meditation retreat, the Vipassana retreat. I won't speak. I won't, I'll eat nothing but rice. I'll sit on a mat for uh, eight hours of the day. And it becomes this great athletic effort of, of the ego, however noble, the ego of trying to attain what, that which it can't attain on its own, namely enlightenment, because enlightenment is precisely the death of the ego, whatever that means. So Shin, Shinran said, actually, we should, we should really stop this. And we should recognize that light comes from outside of us, that uh, it is by the power of the celestial Buddha, Amita, Amitabha, the Bodhisattva, that I am enlightened, if I am enlightened. And if I find myself in darkness, that's exactly where I belong. Shinran said, you know, I, I, I'm a resident of hell. This is my home. I think this is a very... Christian non-dualist uh, attitude, even though it's coming out of Japanese Buddhism, it's that Lutheran, that Lutheran attitude, which is to say there is no amount of failure, sin, and human frailty that can, that can take from me my trust in the power of God to redeem me. The power, or if we want to go in the language of have using the power of the Christ nature. So I, I think that this is something that has, that is, you know, it's not unrepresented in the Christian tradition, 
but it's underrepresented. And it's underrepresented particularly in, in contemporary Christian discussions. I think Christianity is now becoming associated with a certain kind of fundamentalism that's got a political political momentum in the in the in the United States in particular, and we we really need to 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 begin to see that this is a this is a partial and one sided view of of what of what occurred in the New Testament, and it's not faithful to Paul, and it's not faithful to the Gospel of John. I don't even think it's faithful to the Synoptic Gospels. It's a kind of fixation on the historical Jesus, a kind of you know that that this is all about. This man who lived 2,000 years ago and it did something for us, and the rest is really just human beings mucking along. The event, which was certainly historical, was a kind of ground zero for an explosion of grace that goes backwards and forwards throughout history, and in, and in the orbit of which we, we still exist, live, move, and have our being. This, I think, is... is, is, is is faithful to, to certainly to the to the letter to the Ephesians. You know, Paul speaks about the secret of Christ. I love this phrase, the secret of Christ. Not this obvious fact of Jesus walking through the streets of Palestine, telling people to love their neighbors, but the secret. What's what's what is the secret? And the secret he says is in him we have access to God with freedom. It's a direct quote from Paul. The secret of Christ in Him, we have access to God in free with freedom. So that's that's obviously a doctrine for here and for now. That's obviously something that is not confined to you know what we consider to be religion. That's obviously not something that lives or dies with institutional church. You know this argument that you hear sometimes from from people that well obviously Christianity is gone. Because nobody goes to church. This is fallacious. There were no churches when Paul wrote that sentence. There, was no, there, were, there, were, there were no priests. There were no bishops. There were no sacraments in the sense that we understand them. Which isn't to say that all the priests and the bishops and the sacraments are a distortion of the tradition. It's rather to say that whatever Paul was announcing exists independently from these institutions, these familiar institutions and these wonderful institutions and these terrible institutions. You know, Christ, Christendom is, is as guilty as of the greatest sins in, in recorded history, but also of some of the greatest achievements and virtues. And I think this is a familiar dynamic. We also talked about Antichrist. And I'm, I'm more and more convinced, actually, that anti, where anti, that the Christ nature appears, Antichrist also appears. Not that the Christ nature is encouraging Antichrist or needs Antichrist, but that Antichrist is there, and it's a mystery which we will not understand until the end of time. It is the mystery of why evil is permitted to exist in a universe that is created by love and is destined for love. Why does evil, and here we understand by evil, hatred, violence, disunity, why is it permitted to exist? Why? We don't know the answer, but we do know that, but that Antichrist looks like Christ, sounds like Christ. So forget about Ozzy Osbourne and the number of the beast. Think rather of a very seductive, charismatic, and beautiful appeal to what is apparently best in us. Think of something very attractive. The Antichrist in the book of Revelation comes in order to kind of just sort out the sheep from the goats, and he attracts the Christians because he seems to be him. And so we talked about how this antichrist in our time should be could be understood as a way of of interpreting certain things that are at work on our world and maybe will destroy our worlds, which come from Christianity, consumerism, for example, environmental ruin. We can't rely all environmental degradation on on Christianity, but nevertheless, if we know a little bit about the history of Christendom, we know that. It was the momentum of modern European societies, colonial societies, which led to the great acceleration. And it doesn't matter if we don't believe that climate change is anthropogenically caused. I realize this is still a controversial point. I don't understand why. You know, I, I would never raise myself above the, 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 the majority of, of the science in the world today and the greatest collaborative scientific enterprise ever. But nevertheless, you know, it's not a fact. If, if, that's, if that's an issue that's becoming too polarized for us to, to, to point to, why not think 
of ocean plastic. That certainly can't be denied. You know, there's a there's a there's a pool of of plastic in the South Pacific as big as Texas. That's that's not a that's not a political ideology. That's a fact. And that plastic has all been produced in my lifetime. That's what we call the great acceleration. And we could also look at the distinction, the extinction of species of animals and also of people, the disappearance of languages, the different disappearances of cultural diversity in the last 50 years. So one can look at all this and say, this is just how the world evolves. But I don't believe that's true. And I don't even believe that's a good scientific argument. I think that this, this is how our culture, a civilization, a stage of human civilization evolves. And it seems to me that Christianity has far more responsibility for that mess than, let's say, Hinduism or traditional Chinese culture or certainly indigenous culture. So we look at this, this terrible stuff per perpetrated by Christianity, and, it be, and we see that it's often an argument against Christianity. And I see this all the time in the universe and envi in environmental circles. How can we possibly find anything of worth in this dreadful religion that has perpetrated so much violence, colonialism, environmental degradation, what have you. And I would add consumerism because it's not widely recognized, but there is a minor literature that we'll see in consumerism, the expression of perverted Christian values, Christian virtues. And my, my answer would be, this is no disproof of anything. In fact, in a certain way, this confirms what we should expect that where the Christ is, there too the Antichrist shall be. And quite possibly the Antichrist will be much more dramatic, getting, grabbing the headlines and convincing us and leaving the Christ, the light, in the shadow. Yeah, so that, that was something we went through a little bit. Here are a few ad hoc remarks that have come up in discussions with people who have been listening to the podcast. The question about practice came up. You know, Buddhists have this lovely practice. They have they sit on the mat every day and they go on retreats and they do things. And, you know, they have, a, they have a list. And Jordan B. Peterson has a list for us too. And Christians, contemplative Christians, don't have a list of things to do. Doesn't that make us somehow, I don't know, less effective or something? Well, I think actually that these lists are a problem because they create this deception that there's something that we need to do. And, and that creates a further deception that there's something that we could do you know, the kind of a, a delusion of human grandeur. But nevertheless, there are Christian practices, and we talked a great deal about that. We talked about the practice of common prayer. We talked about meditation. We talked about liturgy, or if liturgy is not your thing, getting together with people who believe things similarly to yourself and confirming each other, helping each other. Recently, a little discussion I had with a Buddhist student in my university who's been listening to the podcast, he, he raised this question of practice. And I, it occurred to me that scripture, the reading of scripture, is for Christians what practice is for Buddhists. That is, there is no real contemplative Christianity without, without an attachment, a devotion, a wrestling with, a struggling with scripture. And that isn't to say that all Christians read scripture any more than all Buddhists practice. But it seems to me that scripture has this, this role to play in, in Christianity, that, that it is the necessary but not the sufficient means, you could say. Or perhaps it's not a means at all, but an end in itself, because it's not by reading scripture that we'll be saved. It's not scripture that saves us. This is the fundamentalist mistake. It's the power of the Christ nature that saves us, not the words, not the words written down by people who are long dead. But nevertheless, Christianity has this, this relationship to the proclamation of the word through history, which has been codified in the scriptures, the canon of the scriptures, which was closed sometime in the first century, that you cannot, you just cannot overlook. And in my experience, the more devotion to, the more, the more, the the more committed to scripture a, a, a practitioner is, the more living contemplative Christianity becomes. I'm very suspicious of Christians who are not wrestling with scripture on a regular basis. And with scripture comes everything, the study of history, the study of biblical scholarship, the question about who wrote what, all of these things, this is all part of it. It's all part of the, the contemplative 
Christian path. We talked about psychoanalysis probably a little bit more in the first season, but we did mention something I think that was important in this season. The, in the first season, the, the message was, or the idea was that this is not the end of the road. And in the second season, we talked about the necessity for some people to build up their ego. That is, we, many of us are traumatized by our upbringings, by our lives in the world, by capitalism, whatever, by the media even. And, and we need maybe rules for life. Maybe we even need Peterson's rules for life. Life, or we need to see Jacob for for an analysis. We need to we need we need to heal and to build ourselves up so that we have enough ego structure so that we can look at reality as it is and not distort it with projections that make us that don't threaten us. But ego strength is for the in a contemplative religious context. Ego strength is really just for the sake of ego death. We want a strong ego so that we can die to our ego. We want, nobody takes my life from me, but I lay it of my own free accord, says Jesus. So you've got to have enough ego structure to be able to lay your life down for your friends and it not to be some kind of pathological, masochistic, or even psychological dodge, right? Christianity is obviously not the only game in town. It's not the only way to the truth. That would be stupid. One of the terrible things that Christianity has done is promoted a kind of exclusivism, an intolerance, and that obviously has to be corrected. Nevertheless, if all the paths lead to the same mountaintop, that doesn't mean you can walk all paths. And you're not getting a bird's eye view of the mountain either. You're only going up the mountain if you take a path. And to take a path somehow is to say no to others. And so there is always going to be this tension between the, the, way the, the, appear, the way the way looks to you and the way it looks to others. And I was talking to that same student the other day about this. And he said to me, oh, isn't Jesus like a Buddha? Isn't he like an enlightenment figure? I said, absolutely not. He's not an enlightenment figure. He's not, a, he's, he's not, teaching, he's not teaching enlightenment. In fact, his teaching is pretty common. Other rabbis said similar things. His teaching is not all that exciting, really. It was so unexciting that they didn't even bother to write it down for about 40, 50 years. Not to diminish the Beatitudes and the poetry of the teaching of Jesus. I'm not diminishing it all. But I want to say that the power of this figure does not lie in his teaching. It lies in him and in the way he dies and the way he rises. The event, I told the young student, is the point in this message. And he looked at me and he obviously couldn't go there, being a follower of the Buddha and a follower of, of enlightenment. And I said, that's exactly right. You should not be able to go here. You can't believe in this and cease being a Buddhist any more than I could believe in karma and enlightenment and cease being a Christian. And that's the tragic nature of life in, in the body. If we don't see the top of the mountain, we see our path. Does that mean we're justified in, in being intolerant to each other and censoring each other? Obviously not. I think the last point I want to make here before I open this up, because I'm really curious to hear some reactions here, is that secular Christianity or secular Christ and contemplative Christianity for me are coming together, and maybe for you too, Yako. And that's because I believe that this is really the only way forward for a civilization, a Christian civilization in decline. Contemplative Christianity is the only way forward for post Christendomian Christianity. And it's the only way forward for you know, negotiating with other traditions, with other religions, even with atheism and secularism and this, in a kind of anti religious sense. All of this really requires a much deeper commitment to the contemplative, mystical practice of the Christ nature than we, we, than we have seen in mainstream, mainline denominations. Thank you, Sean. So let's, let's open up and see if anyone has any spontaneous, immediate reactions to what Sean has summarized or any other questions that you might be thinking of as you've been listening to the podcast. Yeah. I um, I could start. It's, it's a bit of a complicated, so I'll have to... One of the challenges that I found 
in your talking, Sean, is is the tension between the agency and the giving yourself to the bigger power. I have uh, you, you. You started talking about the different tensions that we hold in religion, and I believe from from my perception there was certain collapse in the tension between the agency of what I do, what I, what are my power, what I, what, what am I should do, morality, responsibility, and ta 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 and, and the tension between that and the tension of giving, between giving myself to the bigger power. And from that, I would also say that I think you're degrading, from my perception, you're degrading psychoanalysis or psychotherapy a bit, bringing it only to building the ego. I think it, it, it's kind of degrading it because if we take the agency and if the agency would take a bigger role, then psycho psychotherapy or any work also has to do with our relation to others and the way we relate to others. And it's not only fixing some basic fold in our ego structure, but also developing ourselves in our relation to others, in our moral structure, in our in our capabilities of our agency to make a change in the world. And I understand your, the challenge about taking self power and about Hebrews in, in the element of self power. But I still, I, 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 I listened to it quite a few times, but I, 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 I couldn't, couldn't relate to your way of presenting the agency as almost power. Well, thank you very much. It's, it's Yosef, is it? And where, 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 where are you beating in from? I am Berlin. I am, oh, yeah. I am psychotherapist in Berlin. Yeah. Oh, good. Yeah. Well, let me start with the psychoanalytical bit because that, that's somehow an easier, I think I, it's an easier challenge for me to respond to it. Guilty as charged. I think basically I'm talking about the pop psychology, which is not a, it's not the serious practice of analysis, what modulated through varieties of different schools. I, I think the context here was important. We were talking about self-help. We we're talking about Jordan Peterson, and we we're talking about how, you know, Jungianism in particular has been sort of absorbed by the self-help literature so and so i you know obviously this generalization that this is about building up ego structure would 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 probably not even apply to that whole community but i think it applies to a lot of it and if we were going to talk about psychoanalysis in a much more nuanced sense that we would have to say that really is inadequate you know psychoanalysis is not only about building up ego structure and i appreciate you pointing it out to me that said psychoanalysis of course doesn't agree on much beyond that, although there are various schools don't really agree on what more can be done beyond that. And so you kind of see this uptake of psychoanalysis in the universities, and in academic psychology, as really just a CBT ego structure development through a, a technique of, of, you know, talking therapy or something like that. Because when you go beyond that, which is where psychoanalysis gets interesting, you get all the fractures, the distinctions. We just talk about classical Freudianism, Lacanianism, and Jungianism as you know, not agreeing on the on what psychoanalysis is doing when it's doing when it's going beyond just healing people from trauma and giving them sufficient ego structure to work into love, as Freud put it. So, I mean, if we were to take two 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 schools, we'll take Lacan and we'll take you. We have very different ideas about what you know what the goal of psychoanalysis could be if it's not just building ego structure. But in Lacan, you get the traversing of the real, which is some kind of unmasking of the symbolic lie constitutive of human subjectivity. You know, we have to somehow live a kind of some, a lie. We have to substitute the symbolic in a certain way for, for our being, because there's something insurmountably traumatic about existence as such. 
And the Lacanian helps us to see that we're going to remain neurotic because there is really no other option unless we choose psychosis. And this, this is a kind of, this is the process of traversing the fantasy and recognizing, you know, that we, we, we are, our identities subsist. They, they, they rest on these fictions we tell ourselves about who we are. There's Lacan. And that's much more could be said. And then we have Jung, who's bringing us down a path of individuation, which apparently has something to do with the divine imago Dei or the self, the archetype of the self and the kind of realization of, of, of spirits in the world through the person that I am. Now, to my eye, these two, these two psychoanalyses are, are advancing beyond therapy into something much more robust, something that I would probably in other contexts call metaphysics. Certainly something that's bound up with a lot of other decisions about like what's real and what's not real, what's true and what's false, what's good and what's evil, what's the origin and what's the destiny of humanity. I think in, in Lacan, it's absolutely clear that, it, that, his, that his atheism is, is, is the answer to these questions. And at that point, I say, okay, good. This is terrain that I know well. I'm a theologian. I'm really interested in these questions. What's true? What's false? What's good? What's bad? What's the origin? What's the end? And I'm not going to take Lacan's atheist answer as my guide in life. Right? And so I think a Christian, like a Buddhist, like any serious practitioner, like anybody, or even anybody who's serious about metaphysics, they're going to have to become extremely critical with psychology or psychoanalysis, particularly the psychoanalysis, when it begins to move, as it perhaps must, beyond the, the, um, the relatively unproblematic therapy for damage. So that, that would be my point. And, you know, and I'm, I, I wouldn't, so I'm not denying that psychoanalysis does a lot more than fix egos, but I am denying, I'm, I'm hesitant to say that that, that that more really has much place in, let's say, a thoroughly contemplative religious practice, which ought to be as rigorously psychological as Lacanian analysis or Jungian analysis. So I guess I'm saying it was a shorthand way of dealing with a kind of pop assimilation of psychoanalysis, which as you know, is running on Hard times these days. There might be little circles in Berlin where it's popular, but believe me, the rest of the world, you know, I, I, I teach in different universities. I'm generally, I'm the only person who teaches psychoanalysis in the university because nobody's talking about it. You know, and that, that's even true at McGill University, one of the biggest research universities in Canada. It's just regarded as something, as one colleague said, oh, well, didn't we prove that to be all false some time ago? Isn't that like Santa Claus or something? So, so it's, you know, psychoanalysis has sort of fallen on hard times, along with a lot of other things from the 20th century. And what seems to have remained of it is a kind of watered-down ego psychology filtered through the self-help industry. And that's what I'm targeting. Not Lacan. I'm not, too, I'm not so stupid as to take Lacan with that argument. And not even you. But I also would just add what I already said, that we shouldn't assume that you and Lacan and the others, when they get, you know, sophisticated about their paradigm have, are agreeing or could agree at all because they're, they're, they're coming up against fundamental metaphysical oppositions or even religious, I would think, even religious commitments that make it impossible for them to agree on what the goal of, let's say, analysis that isn't simply medical therapy might be. So that's the easier answer. To, the, hard, the easier question, see, the harder one is the question of agency. And honestly, this is, this seems to me the toughest nut to crack. And in the two traditions that I know best, that would be in Christianity and in Buddhism, both struggle with this immensely because the stakes are so high. On the one hand, if we talk about it in a Christian context, you have this kind of lazy passivity. It's all done for me. Just wait. Jesus is coming. And he'll sort out the sheep from the goats. And I can go ahead and just live my life as though it doesn't matter what I do. And on the other hand, you have the, you know, this kind of religion of self-effort, which is, I think, unbelief. You know, we saw, we saw of course, Luther struggled with it. It's, it's in Augustine as well. Augustine struggles with it. 
I, I think it's a center, centerpiece of the dispute between the Reformation and, and Catholicism. And Catholicism has been forced to real to recognize from the critique, this powerful critique coming from Protestant theology and the strongest theology of the 20th century is Protestant. People like Karl Barth, this critique coming at them that you're Pelagians, you know, you're denying grace. You're setting up some pokey little show for the human being, you know, and, and that's unbelief. And Catholicism has, 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 has over and over again have to, had to struggle with it and to articulate what the relationship is between grace and nature. On the one hand, you don't want nature to be completely annihilated by grace. On the other hand, you don't want to deny that grace is grace and there's nothing that you can do that could earn it. And then it wouldn't be grace. And it's not enough just to repeat Thomas Aquinas and say grace perfects nature. You know, there, there, it's, it's, a, it's a difficult, difficult thing. And I think here we are on non-dual terrain in such a way that in, in the sense that we can't simply define the formula, but it's going to have to be lived. You know, Austin Farr, 20th century theologian said, if a child, if a child cannot walk without the help of its parents, it doesn't mean he's dragged. And I love this. This is such a lovely, concrete image for what we're talking about. The child can't walk without mommy's hand, but it's not mommy that's walking, it's the child, right? So, and I, for me, this is, the, this is, the, this is the, the fundamental answer that we typically get, that we get from, the, from theology, and I think even from people like Bart and his later work, when it comes to the question of what role is there for agents? And it's right there in the center of Paul, you know, Paul has to speak to the Thessalonians and the Galatians who are misunderstanding him. They think, well, we can do what we like. And guess what? It's the Roman Empire, and there's a lot of things that we can do in the Roman Empire in terms of what we like, you know? Uh, we can have sex with our slaves. We can go watch people get torn to pieces by lions, you know, because not, none of it matters because it's, we're going to be uh, we're redeemed through the power of Christ. And Paul's answer is always, no, no, no. It matters what you do. You know, it matters what you do. So I, 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 I think that this question of agency and grace is the centerpiece of mystical religion. It's the centerpiece of mystical, of contemplative religious practice, also in, in Buddhism, for sure. And I think that's exactly what that, this, that dialogue between Shinran and, and other medieval Japanese Buddhist masters is about. And somehow or other, the, the proper answer is always action of a certain kind and not a new formulation or definition of the situation. Mm. We, have, we have two more questions. Two people who raised their hands. I don't know who's, who, who started here. I asked Jordan to maybe if you could begin and ask your question. Ask him. Yeah. yeah. Eric raised their hand first, but if you want, if you want to go, let's... We have time for both. So if you start and then, yeah, thank you. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I really appreciate the, the talk. I have some thoughts and a question. I kind of been thinking about the, the concept of the Antichrist from a psychological perspective and whether the Antichrist could be what we see in neurotic and, and psychotic clients and patients, whether it's just like fleeing from suffering, from accepting what, what is and fleeing into what, what is holding on to, whether it's, you know, the fantasy of I can't accept not having this girl, so I'm going to just sort of fixate on, oh, I wish it would be like this, or even like a psychotic fantasy of, you know, you are literally avoiding reality and your, your psyche is sort of, you know, split in a, in a dramatic way because you can't get past the fantasy. And so that's sort of thoughts I have, and I would like to hear your response to that. And also, I have a question about the concept of love in Christianity. And I think, I think normally, we certainly, I, for a long time, had this idea that love is like a feeling that we have towards someone. And of course, we know a lot about, you know, uh, the, the super ego and how much we get shamed when we don't feel love, as if like feeling, for example, anger towards someone is contradictory to loving someone. And I'm thinking about Jesus in his life, particularly like in the temple where he was like turning the tables over it and, and where we see anger there. But there, it doesn't seem in contradiction with love because Jesus's nature is love. And so I've sort of been wrestling with this, I guess, in my own life about understanding what it means to love and also feel these range of emotions. I wonder what your thoughts are about that as well. Thank you, Jordan. So Jordan, we, we corresponded, didn't we? Yeah, yeah. You're the young contemplative. 
I am the youngest. Yes. Nice to, <laughs> nice to meet you as well. Thank you for your question and thanks for the exchange before, which, which was so fruitful for me and helped me uh, articulate something. Yeah, the neurosis, psychosis, antichrist thing is a difficult one. And, and, and here I almost feel, here I feel like I am not qualified really to talk about, you know, mental illness as it should be discussed in the context of that question. I have written on this. I have written on, on, on Lucifer as the first psychotic. And I was thinking in particular about Jakob Burma and Jakob Burma's, the way Jakob Burma flushed out the figure of Lucifer because he goes into it like nobody before him went into it. And he thought, he thought to himself, like, what, did, what kind of... So here's the light bearer, the highest one, right? The one closest to God. He doesn't have the excuse that you and I have of ignorance of you know, we can only see in a glass darkly. Lucifer's not struggling with that problem. He looks into the face of God and he sees absolute goodness. And he knows that God is the only game in town, that there's really no other option. And he knows that this option is for his fulfillment and, his, and for the fulfillment of others. And yet he says, no. And, and, and Burma really goes into this. Like, first of all, what is the power that Lucifer has to say no to the, to the infinite God? And second, why would he do it? And the first, the first point is that the, the power comes from God, God's self. Like this, only God could give that kind of power away. And so there is a kind of power of the negative in God, which God has eternally overcome. It's very much like the id, actually. There's a, there's a dark uh, force in God of self-assertion, egoism, and I will that there should be nobody other than me, this sort of dark center of this dark center of self-assertion, which God... Uh, eternally overcomes insofar as God is God and which he lets loose into creation so that there might be freedom and there might be things other than God. And we could think here of, you know, just how without self-assertion, nothing lives, you know, without a kind of natural egoism, a plant, even a plant won't survive. So that's the power of the no that's been sort of set, 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 set loose into creation and which comes to a kind of heightened spiritual expression in Lucifer's free negation of God. But why would he do it? Why would he, why would he say no when he knows that the no, that, that the no is only, can only result in destruction? Why would he say it's better, you know, Milton, the poet John Milton, built on Burma's figure of Lucifer and wrote Paradise Lost and has Lucifer kind of this, as this, this anti-hero, this tragic anti-hero who says it's better to rule in hell than to serve in heaven. And we can sort of get what that means. Like, Lucifer, he's standing up for, standing up against a man. You know, he's, he's himself. He's an individual. He's free. But I, the way that Werner looks at that is that this is, there's something psychotic about that. Because in the moment where Lucifer, where Lucifer chooses his no over God's yes, his whole personality unravels. A little bit like, you know, Raskolnikov in Prime and Punishment. I mean, it, it completely dements him. And uh, can only dement him because God's the only game in town. There's only one way to be healthy. And so Lucifer then becomes Satan. And the, the two are really very distinct from Burma. And Satan really is, you know, a psychopath where Lucifer was the highest of the angels. And the transformation of Lucifer into the psychopath is through, Luc to, through, through Lucifer's own free negation. So that, uh, that's what I wrote about. And as I wrote about it, I realized that there's, we can misunderstand that sadness completely and say that, you know, schizophrenics are guilty of their schizophrenia. They're responsible for their schizophrenia, some horrible kind of alt-right, you know, that's nonsense, of course. It's absolute nonsense. The point is that there is something, there's something working. And, and uh, here I would say, though, we're, we're not equal to Lucifer. We're not equal to, we couldn't look into the face of God and say no. And when that happens, the world changes. That's the myth of the fall. And the, like all myths, it's full of explanatory power, even if it ultimately is a myth. And the myth, and the myth is that the, that the world is full of things that ought not to be, or at least tendencies, because like, evil is not a thing. In tendencies and distortions and you know things that ought not to be, but which are because of this original no. And for me, psycho, uh, psychopathology is certainly one of those things that ought not to be. 
it seems to me that it would be a better universe where people did not suffer debilitating mental illness. Uh, I live in downtown Montreal, and basically I'm walking around with uh, schizophrenics all the time, yelling at themselves and screaming. And the, just the other day, there's a woman walking down the street and she was screaming and, and she was cursing. And it occurred to me, you know, what is the power of that? The energy of that, right? It's such a common thing. Like it always comes out in this, in, the, in cursing and anger. Like she, she's just a font of anger and she, she's completely out of control. She doesn't, she probably can't hold a job. She probably doesn't even know who she is, but she is, a conduit of this negativity. But where does that negativity come from? What is you know? So if we want to call that antichrist, let's not make the mistake of saying that it has nothing to do with us or that the person is responsible or they've sold their soul to the devil. Rather, what we should see there is something that ought not to be in which we ought to give our lives to, 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 to healing and to correct it. Well, maybe just to say one word about that, and we've been touching upon this in previous conversations, in the practice, you know, I think this overcoming unconsciousness and becoming more conscious of our pathologies or of our neurosis or of our narcissism, it's a work of, it's a work of love and it's a work of overcoming, if not evil, you know, absolutely things that hurt others. I meet patients dreaming about the devil or, you know, feeling almost possessed by the devil that I would say that a part of, part of the work is just, and that's where I think psychoanalysis has this, yeah, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an absolutely one of the most important liberating projects and it's very connected to Christianity in, in the sense that it, yeah, it, it, it introduces reality and it overcomes illusion and it helps to overcome narcissism. And I would say narcissism more than neurosis is devilish the way that it's being lived out. And I think you, you reminded me of that quote uh, from, from you, which I, I paraphrased, but yeah, the only thing I would call evil is unconsciousness. So, so could you say more about, about the role of love in psychoanalysis? Like, could you be more specific? Like, you mean like the, the love of the analyst, like the generosity and the goodwill of the analyst? How, how does no, that... I, think it's, I, think, I think the work for many people is overcoming self-love. I mean, narcissism is self-love, no? And that Bible is, is, is talking about that. And, you know, it's, it's a question of being able to hold the object relationships, to be able to see the other person as a whole, to be able to see reality as it is, not through your projections. Right. We've spoken about love, and you, you will lead over to that. I mean, love in Christianity is, 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 is definitely, there's more to it than what happens in psychoanalysis, but I think it's, it's, quite, it's quite an overcoming if you can transcend, even if it's for moments, your, your narcissism and connect with another person and, and find yeah, generosity. And, and that's where I think the psychoanalytic project and also Jung's project is, is working, you know, within the tradition of overcoming evil. I think that's very interesting because it's so closely tied up with the structure of this myth that we discussed. Because, you know, the, the challenge is to recognize, to let others be. Right? That's the fundamental axial challenge. I mean, according to Jakob Burma, it begins with the birth of God. The birth of God occurs for Burma when whatever preceded God decided that others shall be, that they shall be others. And in that moment, this, you know, this primary narcissism, if you like, where it became, became a dark ground of the personality, something that should be held in potency, held down, not repressed. It's a different kind of thing than repression. It's, it's rather, uh, well... We won't get too technical in it because it brings us into shelling and all kinds of other matters. But this dark ground of, of, of uh, subordinated narcissism, it supports the personality. It, lets, it allows us to stand up. But what it supports it as is as a loving, relating being who, who can relate to others, who can recognize the needs of others, who can see others as having their own claim to existence. And that's precisely what Lucifer says no to. He does not want others. Ultimately, he doesn't want God, and he, and he wants no one else either. And, and so his relationships as Satan are all instrumental relationships. He can only relate to humans, or persons that have been reduced to objects, to instruments, whatever. And you get the kind of fundamental paradigm of what evil is that, that persists from Augustine right to time. They don't agree on much, but they'll agree on this, this instrumentalization of the free, the, of the other, turning the other into a means towards your own end, your own ends. This is the base formal gesture of evil because it's a way of saying there is no one but me. 
I know we're limited with time. Should we to the second question from Jordan? And then we have a question from Eric as well. Yeah, well, the, the concept of love and Christianity, I and mean, this is a massive thing. I, I would just say this, love is another word for, another name for Christ's nature. God is love. That's a sentence from the first letter of John. And he meant, now the word he used was agape. And then this whole debate happens about the difference between agape and eros. Eros being like the selfish love, the love that wants something for yourself, and agape being the love that lays its life down for the other. And this is a massive literature around this. We're not going to solve it here. Is it to say, however, that the, the feeling that you're referring to, you know, the powerful feeling, this really is terrain of love as eros. And Plato has the great, you know, Plato is the, the authority on this. For Plato, this, this, this powerful feeling of attraction for the other is what will lead us ultimately to divinity. And then in the whole medieval mystical tradition, they take up that platonic theme and the soul sort of becomes, no, no, I don't want all these less, lesser things, consumer enjoyment and wealth and sex. I don't need any of that. I want the one, you know, I want the big one. And so there's a great, uh, uh, there's an intensification of the erotic relationship in, in the mystical soul. You, you see this really powerfully in people like John of the Cross, for example, or Teresa of Avila. But the question remains, you know, is this just a human thing or does this have anything to do with divinity? And Karl Barth will say, on the contrary, it has nothing to do with divinity. This is just human stuff. I'll just give you my take on it. I think love is the primary form of, the eros is the primary form of I think even agape should be understood in terms of eros. I think agape is another way of describing God's love for us, God's erotic love for us. God has an eros for us. He wants us, you know? And, 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 and so it is, it is eros, this eros love is the love that is released into being when that primary narcissism is negated and we let the other be. We let the other be. We're not just indifferent. Now we long for the other in union. We want to be one with the other. We don't want to just dissolve the other into ourselves, but we want this higher union of two who are free and who freely commit themselves to each other forever. That, that's the highest image of, of human, of relationality. And it happens to be also the image of the Trinity. It's, what's, it's what the persons in the Trinity enjoy eternally. Hmm. Eric, you've been waiting. Hi, Sean. I'm a big fan of your work, so thank you for <laughs> taking the time to, to speak with us, especially after having had the opportunity to listen to the podcast. I came across your work through Chris Satur, through his mutual involvement with you in the Schelling Society and stuff like that. I'm a past graduate <laughs> from the Concordia Studies Program, and I focus most of my time on East Asia, and then I got introduced to the work of Professor Charles Davis, I guess, the founder of the Religious Studies Department up at Concordia. So once I started to dive into your work, I mean, it's just been a huge honor and just, I mean, it's brought on so many questions for me. <laughs> so I'm super excited to, to just kind of connect with you and just acknowledge that to you. But I guess my question is, is that, I mean, since you did all your work on Heidegger, and you did a lot of, you kind of do a bit of bouncing around, I guess, with so-called people within the postmodern theology movement, if we can go out and call it that. And, you know, the fact that I just said that, you know, Charles Davis was much more on the sort of critical theology or might be maybe a pioneer in that field or that movement. My question is really, you know, how do you situate your work within that those confluence of thinkers and movements. And I guess the fact that you're focusing in on the idea of being and contemplation is very pertinent for me. And I'm interested to see or hear a bit more, you know, why you're focusing in on that instead of going the more kind of postmodern theological twist and, you know, just focus in on language or on culture or verse, vice versa. So I'm just curious to hear a bit more of your thoughts on that in light of, you know, the fact that you guys called your, your podcast, the secular Christ as well, which is very powerful sort of, you know, motif and sy symbolism, I guess you can say for me. So it's really attracted me to the podcast too. So yeah, that's about it. Thanks, sir. Thanks, Eric. Nice to meet you. So I guess you're a, you're a, you're a Montrealer. Yeah. Born and raised. Yeah. I love Montreal and great cities in the world. 
And but don't tell anybody because it's perfect <laughs> like it is. But thank you for the question. I appreciate it very much. And yes, I, you said I did, did most of my work on Heidegger. I kind of got into Heidegger really only because he so annoyed me on medieval philosophy, which I thought I knew something about because I had the five years in the middle. I lived in the Middle Ages for five years. All I read was medieval theology and mysticism. And then I got to the University of Toronto and I, I took a, a graduate course in Heidegger to see what all the fuss was about. And the first thing I opened up was basic problems of phenomenology where Heidegger starts to, to distort Thomas Aquinas, at least it appeared to me at the time. And so I, I, I made the terrible decision to write a dissertation that was critical of the figure on whom I was writing. It's a terrible decision because it leaves you with no community. Because the Heideggerians were particularly interested in that. And the people who were interested in it, I wasn't really interested in. It was sort of like these Thomists of the strict observance started to invite me to the American Catholic Philosophical Association meetings. And I suddenly realized, oh, I don't really belong here either. So, and then, and then of course, I've learned so much from Heidegger and I'm, I teach him all the time. And then finally, I, I, I'm finally far distanced enough from, from him that I can teach him, I think, responsibly. But most of my positive work has been on Shelley. And as soon as I, I could get, you know, as soon as I found Schelling, which was pretty much my first year teaching, I just didn't turn back. So I've done much more work on Schelling. And I, with Schelling, although I have a critique, I'm, I'm you know, he's my master. Uh, okay. And Schelling is an interesting figure vis-a-vis -vis continental philosophy because the continental philosophers love him. You know, he's, he's one of their guys insofar as they know about him. And he's had a big influence on continental philosophy. I think he had a big influence on post-modernity in France, in fact, because he, in the, especially in the 90s, his late work was all translated and people like Derrida and others began to read him well, well, long before, you know, continental writers in the English language started to read him, which only happened. It's, it's still just happening now. So, but Schelling is a curious guy because he, he's neither, he's, he's neither continentalist nor analytic because there's a certain thing that happens in continental philosophy, which Schelling is would be totally opposed to, and I'm opposed to it too. And that is this rejection of argument, this rejection of logic, this dismissal of, you know, as Heidegger says, you know, logic, can, logic can't really decide anything fundamental. Well, that's sort of true. Logic doesn't decide anything. But the power of argumentation, the principle of reason, the need for clear explanations, all of that kind of traditional philosophical work, as you know, the continentalists said, well, that's for children or something. And now we're going to go after the real animal, which is language. I, I'm, I'm not on board with that. I think that, uh, I don't think it works. I think it pre performatively contradicts itself. I think every philosopher is trying to explain the world as they find it, even if they, they, dis they, they say all they're doing is analyzing the way we speak or something like that. But that said, you know, I probably, you know, my colleagues would uh, uh, to situate me, they'd say he's a continental philosopher of religion. And that's fine. That's fine. I mean, Richard Carney is a friend of mine, and he's helped me a great deal in my career. I, I, I loved uh, Vatimo's book, After Christianity. And the late Derrida just blew my mind and corrected all my misconceptions about deconstruction. I was at Toronto when he, when he, when he was there in two, uh, 1990 or nine or something like that, anyway, and he stood up and said, you know, deacon, justice cannot be deconstructed. And I said, yes. Not everything's on the table. <laughs> And so, uh, yeah, I'm happy enough to be with the continentalists, but I want to just sort of acknowledge that the, that, that whole that, di that dispute of philosophy, it, it really doesn't even exist anymore. It's just departmental politics now, which is the worst kind of, you know, effect of it. You know, in other words, we don't want to hire an analyst. We don't want to hire a continentalist. We want people who talk like we do. And Schelling doesn't really talk like either of them. And increasingly, neither do I. I note that we've already opened Five minutes over time. If anyone has to leave, they leave. But also, I'd like to take the opportunity to ask if there's any feedback or thoughts on what you guys would like to hear more about or like orientation. We can also email about this later, but if there's anything anyone wants to share there, because I mean, this whole uh, initiative has been rather spontaneous and, you know, we've done two smaller seasons, but we haven't really decided even if it should be another season or if we should do like some sort of course or, you know, anything else. We are kind of open there. So is anyone that wants to jump in and you're welcome to share your thoughts on that? What could be interesting? 
Yeah, David? Yes, if I may. David from the U.S., and I've been intrigued with the podcast by, due to the question Yosef raised, agency. And Sean, you're really clear on that from your point of view, and that's very, been very helpful. I really struggle with that also. In particular, in our immediate context in the U.S., there's a, it's great time of divisiveness and people going after, you know, following slogans, and there's the depth is, seems to be going away. So if you could continue conversations about that, you know, I, that would be helpful for me. So just to be clear, so questions around concerning agency or concerning in the context of politics too? Including politics, but a human agency in the process, not only of po political happenings, but also understandings. You know, you've emphasized how there's there's much that we can't do. And, and I tend to agree with most of that, that. There's work that God does. At the same time, we have our responsibility and so, we're, you know, it's a fine line and it'll be different probably for each of us, but including political, but mostly human and religious agency. I think what, what you both have been doing has, has been fantastic. I think if any sort of suggestion, I would definitely be curious to hear your, your, you all's thoughts on different types of theologies particularly like maybe queer theologies or womanist readings of, of, of scripture. I, I just would like to hear your thoughts on it. And I really liked your lectures on shelling. And I was wondering, I, I don't know if that's maybe if it's a part of the main audience, but definitely like more like philosophy would be awesome. My background, so my undergrad is in philosophy. So that's like a big part of how I relate to spirituality as well. And then having that philosophical understanding. So I think that would be pretty cool if, if we, if you must have more of that. It's, it's a bit of a complicated one. I guess for me, I'm coming from a religious Jewish background and I studied in kind of religious organizations. And since I left it, there was this sense of community and sense of a religious experience, this religious, this deep and profound connection that came from, from religion that was not for me. And that is something that I'm searching and I really don't know how and so it just kind of just throwing it to the, to the earth. It's a, it's a huge one, isn't it? And in, uh, you know, I think the one thing we all have to kind of admit that while this is amazing that we're all meeting each other, there is something missing here. You know, H human community can't survive on Zoom alone. So how, how, do we, how do we go beyond this? And it's a very big question for me. I don't know the answer. And it seems that the technology is just making it harder and harder because everybody is so, quite, so satisfied with their world, you know? Everybody's got their, they got their world. They walk around looking at their world and, yeah. But even not that, we don't have a common song we could sing. Mm -hmm. Do you understand that we're all sitting here, we don't have one song that we could sing together. And yes. that's, that's, that's a tragedy. Yes, I couldn't agree more. I sometimes tell my 16 year old son that we used to sit around listening to records together. He doesn't understand what that would mean. You know, lying on the carpet with your buddies listening to the new Zeppelin album, you know? Uh, it would, that, there were a community there that, that's gone, you know? Yeah. Let me think about that. Thank you. Can you hear me? I'm not sure if it's working. Yeah. Kim, we can hear you. Yes, okay, wonderful. So, so to, to go on to this point from Yosef, I, I feel like sort of when I first sort of entered or, you know, started entering into Christianity, I... You know, you, you sort of do so much research, you're so sort of in, in touch with it. And I felt like I was talking to a lot more people about it because it was so fresh. And I think you're sort of in this space between maybe, you know, non-belief and belief. And I would maybe like some more 
maybe some more of the fundamentals and to sort of go through some of the fundamentals that we can also talk to normal people about and sort of I guess I get you know with, with Christianity I think it's sort of it is also about sort of spreading the word and having a conversation and I'm not sure what you guys sort of feel about that but I feel like it is like there's this huge fear of talking to anybody about it and you know that leads us to not really having anyone to talk to about it I'm not sure if that sort of resonates with others but you know I, I definitely feel like I don't really approach people as much anymore and that's that's a shame you know? the other point of Kim, the other point there is that not, the other consequence is that nobody understands it anymore. Yeah. You know, there's, a, there's an entire, you know, there, you know that, that's something we, we need to think about. People don't understand fundamental claims that Christians make anymore. I think that's sort of, you know, becoming a bit more versed in that to be able to just hold a, you know, you know non-judgmental conversation with someone in a respectful way you know, it would, would be really helpful for, for lots of people to be able to sort of interact. But that's also sort of, you know, maybe not in, you know, I'm not sure if that's any, any kind of direction that I can just um, go with having these conversations. Well, I think oh, that's really the, valuable, Kim. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah. The title is great. It's so provocative. I mean, it, it opened up so many avenues, I think, you know, in terms of the subjects that you guys were talking about. I mean, obviously I would love to, to hear you guys go off a bit more on, on, you know, any of the subjects you guys have already touched upon and go in and do a little more depth. So I hope there is another season and you guys <laughs> keep it going. I mean, that would be my suggestion. <laughs> yeah. That, and I would also I've really enjoyed it. Like the early church as well. I really like the episode on community and going into the early church, I feel like it would be fantastic as well. I don't know how everyone else feels about that. But I would like that. I think for me and Sean, this is really special just to just to get some faces and to hear that you, you that you like what we're what Sean and I engage in and it has been really nice to see you all the or soon and we'll 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 continue in some way and we'll keep you posted. It was really great to to have this chat together. And I don't know, Sean, if you want to say a few last words before we log out. Yes, I, I do. I, I want to thank you for coming, for, for taking the time to, to zoom in and to show your faces. And I have a hard time getting my students to turn their cameras on. So it's very nice to see all your faces and thank you for listening. It's It's been really important for me to to connect with you in this medium. But I, and I, I particularly want to thank Jakob because if it wasn't for his impulse, none of this would have happened. It was Jakob's energy, Jakob's enthusiasm and persistence and diligence and professionalism about the whole thing that made it happen. So I'm really very grateful to Jakob. And I want to, although I realize I, it's mostly my air time on secular Christ, you know, it was uh, Jakob's framing that made it all possible. So I'm really grateful. It's a great service to me. Thanks, Sean. Thank you. Okay, so we stop for today and yeah, thank you all for joining in. Take good care. Bye, guys. Take care, everyone. Bye. Ciao.